This is Mr. Brian Weaver, author, YouTuber, and the owner and operator of the largest online resource for paranormal researchers and enthusiasts, GhostQuest.net. Brian is going to take us on a journey to some of the most haunted places around the world. So turn off all your lights, turn up the white noise on your recorder, as we turn the spotlight on GhostQuest.net and Mr. Brian Weaver. Talk a little bit about the origin of how you got started and what you're doing. Sure. So um, my name is Brian Weaver. Uh, I'm the founder and creator of a website called ghostquest.net, um, which is kind of how all this got started. So what I am working on is uh, over the last several years, I have put together one of the internet's largest databases of allegedly haunted locations uh, and paranormal hotspots throughout the United States. And if you go to my website, it's listed, it's broken down by state. There's like a map uh, and you can click on your state. And um, what I've been doing is I've been going through and taking each state and creating a book for it. And so right now I have three books out called The Folklore and Haunted Locations Guide, Massachusetts. And I have one for Michigan and another one for New York as well. And I'm currently working on one for Texas. So that's kind of how this all got started. I started it off as like a website and a database. And then once I started uh, writing the stories, I realized, you know, it was, it was some really good ghost stories. So I started writing these books that are part travel guide, part, you know, uh, non nonfiction historical kind of stuff, part true crime, part paranormal. Um, you know, we talk about Bigfoot here and there, uh, UFOs, so. While many monsters and undiscovered creatures are said to lurk in the vast forests, caves, mountains, and swamplands of North America, none are as infamous or well-known as the Sasquatch, a.k.a. Bigfoot. Did you always have, like, a love for ghost stories, paranormal activity? Are you somebody who's experienced that as, as, as a child or uh, in your lifetime? Mm. Or was this just a fascination uh, and you were looking for something to talk about and you've kind of grown into it? So I've never actually had an experience that I can say was truly paranormal, but it is kind of a passion and an interest of mine. And I remember when I was young, I would hear these stories about places that I had been to or heard of and, you know, hear that there's a ghost story attached to them. And that really got my interest, not so much, you know, uh, the ghost stories to me are really cool and interesting. Um, but as somebody who's never really experienced paranormal activity, I'm drawn a little bit more to the history of these locations and, you know, the actual stories uh, that lead to the ghost stories. Like, you know, a lot of them are based on uh, true crime events that happened or like in my folklore and haunted locations guide, Massachusetts. 
I write about the Salem witch trials, the Lizzie Borden house, stuff like that. And um, I've, I've always been into TV shows like Ghost Hunters and Ghost Adventures, just because I love looking at these historic, beautiful places. And um, I'm the kind of person that I'd rather go there during the daytime than go through at night. And it's, it's a really time consuming hobby because I have been on a few ghost hunts and I got a shout out to all my ghost hunter buddies that there's a lot of work that goes into it. So. Yeah. I think people would be surprised about that. I mean, the equipment, the setting up the, and then the patience you have to have, right? I mean, you, you literally are there probably yeah. without anything going on for hours on end. Now, um, one thing that people don't realize is the review that goes into it. If you do an eight hour investigation and you have three cameras going, that's 24 straight hours that you have to sit there watching him. So it's insane. A lot of these TV shows where they ghost hunt, they have these big crews that go in and they do all that for them. Cause you, you look at some of those shows, they have like dozens of cameras set up. And in my mind, I'm like, wow, that's that's a lot of video footage to go through. <laughs> but it sells it, oh, right? Yeah. So it's worth it to capture that one moment. So. Very true. Yeah, I love those shows. And uh, I'm a skeptic at heart. So, uh, you know, some of them, they do capture some really interesting evidence. But uh, I'm the kind of person I have to be there to believe it. So you also dabble on YouTube and do some video stuff. Mm -hmm. and doing the print versions and then the visual versions is your process different is the way that you approach how you present materials and things like that different or is it just that the mediums are so different that that it, it, it may appear differently but you don't change your process at all i do have a youtube channel it's a uh, ghost quest usa and um, as I go and I make these books, my folklore and haunted locations guide books, I will take them and I'll divide it up. So like my, I, my first YouTube series that I just finished is called the Folklore and Haunted Locations Guide New York. And I do kind of a mix of like a, a narration video, but I'll, I'll divide it up into cities. So if you go to my YouTube channel, you'll find uh, these videos are meant to go along with the book, but you'll find like, oh, the top 10 haunted places in Albany, New York, or New York City, or Buffalo, all these, you know, different cities. I try and pick ones that have a lot of history behind them or have a lot of interesting locations. Um, so you won't get the full list that you would get like in my book. But another thing is that all these locations are available and you can read about them on my website at ghostquest.net if you click on haunted locations. So it kind of all starts, <laughs> it's kind of a funnel really. It all starts, I put it on my website first and then um, it either gets into uh, YouTube form or usually I publish it into a book first because then it goes through some uh, fine tuning and then I'll go through and I'll make the YouTube video of it, which I narrate myself. And the process isn't, it is different because it's a video, but you know, the way I tell the story is the same, but it's good to have that visual aspect to it. I honestly, I really love making these videos because then, you know, it's one thing to read about it, but then I kind of get to show you a little bit because you'll see pictures of these, uh, you know, these abandoned asylums and cemeteries, and some of them are very iconic. The Clayton Opera House in Clayton, New York, was constructed during the early 1900s and was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1997. Employees at the historic Opera House report witnessing apparitions and shadow figures, as well as hearing disembodied voices and footsteps. Although ghostly apparitions are encountered by many visitors, the reason for their presence is unknown. You get to see those locations and, you know, I put in some little animations and it, it adds an extra little spook factor to it that I, I really enjoy. And um, it also gives uh, an opportunity for people that wouldn't otherwise get to see, you know, some people don't browse the web that much, but they do 
you know, view YouTube videos a lot. So, you know, I try and be broad with who I reach with my audience. And then also I link to my book in the videos. So it's kind of, it's kind of all interconnected in a way. So coming at it from a skeptic point of view, um, mm. and, and examining things and really more concentrating on the history of, of why there might be, or that, that this feels like a haunted place or whatever. What do you feel like are the biggest and easiest traps and tropes that people get stuck in? What are some uh, misconceptions that they, they might have, you know, to easily be swayed that you feel like, right. you know, you can bust right here, right now. I myself am not a really a hardcore investigator, but I do notice a lot of patterns. And a lot of what I notice, it kind of stems from a person's thinking. And a lot of times I'll see people that they just want so badly to believe that they're, they've captured something paranormal, that nothing's going to change their mind. So I like to try and encourage people to always be skeptical. It's a really strange frame of mind that you have to be in as an investigator. And on the investigations that I've been on, you have to be like extremely open-minded in the sense that you have to believe that these things are possible that you know ghosts could be doing this and you have to be extremely skeptical because you have to review everything that happens with you know could this have been a car driving by could it have been somebody else on the investigation in a different part of the location kind of what i said a lot of people they'll take any piece of you know evidence to be paranormal in that you know if you use some of this equipment like you know an emf detector uh it's that little box that lights up when you're supposedly in the presence of an electromagnetic field uh which people commonly believe you know it's it's a common belief in the paranormal field that that indicates the present the possibly the presence of a spirit but it can be confused with other you know like electronic cell phone anything electronic in the area uh faulty wiring in a building stuff like that people are really eager to say well this one thing happened and it was weird and i couldn't explain it and and i will agree with you that is weird but as an investigator i like to kind of look at uh clusters of uh phenomena that kind of happen in a close proximity so like um, if you're on an investigation and your uh, your audio recorder picks up a strange sound, maybe a whisper or a clang from from someone that couldn't have been you, and at the same time the temperature drops and your EMF reader sp spikes up a little bit, then that's strange uh, because you know the more evidence that you can gather to support something, the better. Try not to take any one single piece of evidence, quote unquote, or, or, or one single event as proof. And even when you do get a lot of weird things that happen, um, I still am, I hesitate to uh, say I definitely know for sure that that was paranormal because you just can't be sure. It's a personal journey. So, um, you know, make up your own decisions. And I mean, some people, they're just believers because they've had their own experiences or some people just believe because they do. And so they have different standards and levels of uh, proof when it comes to evidence. And that's fine because, you know, uh, the diversity of perspective and opinion, I think, is important because it's gonna give us perspectives we might not have thought of before and when going into a subject we don't know much about such as ghosts i think it's important to keep every possibility in mind when you got started with this when you first did your first look at at a haunted area and and you know did a historical background on something and then put it in context and put everything out there have you since found that you as someone who's you know gone on now gone on some investigations has gotten deeper and 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 done more research on other areas have you found that there's a commonality that you kind of gravitate toward and that you feel like defines your style of how you write it or kind of gives you a starting point for how you write it do you feel like there's a there's something that i know 
is going to be true at the core, and so that's where I begin. It depends. Sometimes, um, you know, different stories, you kind of approach them differently based on kind of what facts are presented. And this is totally different because I know several friends that write fiction, and they're kind of just, you know, there's not any correct way to do it, or there's not really any, well, maybe there are better and worse ways. Um, but what I try and do is uh, I try and tell it like a story because that's what kind of captures people's interests. And, um, you know, in some cases you'll be um, presented with some facts that are behind the event. Like there's a lot of um, Civil War ghosts uh, and Native American ghost stories present it like, you know, these are the events that happened and then, you know, tell the story of um, the battle or the murder or whatever. In a way, it kind of means a lot to me to do that because you're telling somebody's story that otherwise is kind of lost to history. And then afterwards, I'll say, you know, now that you know what happened there, it's more creepy to know that, you know, you hear musket shots uh, from Gettysburg in the middle of the night for no reason and, and stuff like that. And to me, um, as the person who's written it, some of these stories are just absolutely chilling and horrific. They're hard to tell uh, sometimes because, like, for example, in uh, my Folklore and Haunted Locations New York guide, one of the haunted locations in there is the, uh, the September 11th memorial site. You know, that's hard for people to relive, and uh, sometimes you'll get a story where it'll be like, you'll see the pictures of the, the guy's face. And it presents an element of realness to it that to me is is chilling. And I hope I don't disrespect anybody by, oh, it's a ghost story, sensationalize it. I, I try never to do that because, you know, when you see those people in their faces, you, you do see them as a real person. And um, I always try and pay my respects. So, there's a lot of different ways to tell these stories. Sometimes sometimes they're total urban legends and you just are like, hey, this is just weird. I would imagine too, when you're telling stories where people are related to the subject matter or there's something that, that gravitates toward them, they they contact you and give you feedback on it and, and uh, talk about their experience with you. And I'm curious, uh, what is a common thread that people talk about? Is it usually they they go oh i was there and i saw a ghost kind of thing or do they they have something relatable that they really feel like gets personal with them on, on a level f when you get feedback on the stories that you tell both i get a lot of feedback on my youtube videos but um also on my website i do have a section on each state and if you go into the more finer details of each city um you can leave your own stories if you've taken like a youtube videos like I get a lot of urban explorer people that will like, sh you know, leave a link to their video on my website. And I, and I love when that happens. But to answer your question, yes, a lot of times people will say, oh, I've been here and that happened to me. And it's a common thing. Other times I'll have people say, holy crap, this happened to me. And I've never been able to validate this experience before. So it's really cool to be able to kind of let people like almost have like a therapy session with themselves. And um, there are other people there to talk to them as well. Other times, some of the stories will be really sad. Um, like I did a video on my YouTube about uh, New York's most haunted uh, asylums and cemeteries. And, um, you know, I ha I've had a few stories of people that were like, yeah, my great, great, grandmother or something whoever was in this asylum and and this is what they did to her and uh you know she had a lobotomy and they they used to torture her and it brings it home man it really gives it an element of realness it's great that people are willing to share all this because you like i said before it's like you're telling these stories that otherwise people would forget or people just wouldn't know and fundamentally you know <laughs> A lot of ghost stories are based on the fact that, you know, the ghost has regrets or something. In some situations, maybe having uh, those m misinformation, you know, that 
those rumors cleared up about them after their death might help them to find peace, uh, if you believe in ghosts at all. Has has the way you view history changed because of the manner in which you approach it in in in, in the subject matter that you tackle? Do you feel like that you have mm. a different take on history now? Somewhat, yeah. I've always kind of been aware of you know, a, a lot of what I write about is it's American history and a lot of it, uh, I don't, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but a lot of it is whitewashed um, because a lot of what I write about is slavery and the Civil War and, you know, the, the genocide of Native American people in this country. Some of these events are really horrible and tragic and some of them actually you don't even hear about. Like, I never knew about some of these events like for example, there's in my most recent book, which I actually have a copy of right here, The Folklore and Haunted Locations Guide, Michigan. There was a school massacre that occurred in Michigan in, I want to say like the 1930s, where a guy drove his pickup truck into a school full of shrapnel and uh, blew his pickup truck up. And, uh, it, the, and there's like a memorial to it and all this stuff. I'd never heard about that. In that same book, I write a lot about activity during the American alcohol prohibition, uh, some of the violence and uh, instances of, for example, our own government even, you know, adding poisons to the alcohol to kill the uh, the distributors and stuff like that. It's it's insane and it's uh, it's depressing. It's honestly it's a little depressing. It's cool. It's interesting. It's fascinating. And that's why I write about it. It really does change the way that you look at some events. Because like I said, even the 9-11, uh, the date of that attack doesn't really change the way you see it. But it makes it a little bit more haunting knowing that, you know, the, the emotions of that day maybe haven't fully, you know, those people who died that day, they, they may not have moved on. They might not know they're dead. Uh, lots of things, um, and I've covered other stuff too, like the Hindenburg disaster. It brings out an element of our history that would otherwise kind of go unnoticed. You you deep dive research to make these stories happen, and I'm curious for you, is the research something that you really, really enjoy doing, or is shaping the narrative more of what you like to do? I really love the research part of it for a few reasons. I really love it when it comes together. Sometimes it's difficult, but every once in a while you find these facts that like you don't find anywhere else on the internet. So I kind of, I take a, a bit of pride in knowing that there are some tidbits of information um, that you'll find on ghostquest.net or in my books that uh, otherwise you would have to go through public records to find and dig through all this stuff like uh, birth certificates, death certificates, uh, you know, burial locations of certain people. Little missing elements that when I've read the story elsewhere, one of the big things for me is that I have to include these facts. Otherwise, it just kind of sounds vague and it doesn't sound believable. Uh, it can get very frustrating when you're trying to find this one piece of information like what year did this happen in or, or what decade even just so I can have something loosely based on a fact and you just can't find it and it's like oh my god but um, shaping the narrative I love because uh, that's where I kind of get my creative license. You know, like I, I have these facts that I pretty much have to work with. There's really no changing it. But the way that I can tell the story, I can, you know, downplay certain elements or I'll draw attention to elements that mm, get that other people would, would look over because they make people uncomfortable or because I I just... I feel it's my responsibility if I'm going to tell these stories that I, I have to do it correctly and I have to do it a certain way. The Tower of London was built in 1078 as a military fortress by William the Conqueror who invaded England 12 years earlier in 1066. 
The tower was besieged numerous times by enemy factions and countless men and women died violently protecting it. It was later used by England as a prison during the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries and continued to hold political prisoners and prisoners of war until as recently as 1952. Although only seven known prisoners were executed within the Tower of London, 112 other prisoners who were held in the tower were publicly executed nearby at Tower Hill. The Tower of London is one of England's most popular tourist destinations, and allegedly one of its most haunted. In that sense, you know, when I shape that narrative, I can kind of be like, you know, this was a huge injustice. Look how much these people suffered. Uh, you know, I can say things like that. And, yeah. and I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm curious, is there something out of bounds for you? And do you know what that is yet? Have you come across that has, because you, like you mentioned, this is all dark, really dark stuff. And this is really hair and it can take, it can take an emotional toll on you just as easily as it can take on a reader or the people who, who you're probably yeah. talking to that have experienced this or know about it. Yeah, there are some boundaries that I do put up. Uh, maybe not what you're thinking quite, but like in my books, um, one of the things I do is I'll list the location and I'll list its GPS coordinates and I'll list its address so that people can go there. Uh, one thing I won't do is there are some very famous haunted houses that are private property and that they're somebody's residence. Like, uh, for example, in my Folklore and Haunted Locations Guide New York, uh, the Amityville Horror House, somebody lives there. If it were me, I would absolutely hate it if people showed up at my house in the middle of the night, like, ooh, let's get a look inside the window, or like, I might write about it but I won't include the location. But I do put a disclaimer in my book, you know, encouraging people not to do that. And uh, to, you know, if you're gonna be going to a cemetery at night, I mean, just contact the police in that town and ask them if it's okay. Or if you're gonna go somewhere, contact the property owner and see if you can get written permission to be there on a certain night. In terms of, uh, you know, the types of stories I'll tell, I'm sure there is a boundary, but I haven't really come across it yet. There's some really messed up stuff I've written about, but like I said, I kind of have the creative license to downplay certain things. As, as somebody who writes these things, researches these things, and keeps it internal, you know, and puts it and then puts it on paper or puts it in a video, how long? Would, does something like this stick with you? Are you finding that these these stories kind of stick with you a while? And how have you dealt with that as you've done more of them? Do you feel like it gets easier? Do you have a process to get yourself out of that mindset? And because, it, like you said, it's very dark. So I would imagine that kind of sticks with you a little bit. Yeah, it does. The stories themselves stick with me in the in the sense that I remember them. But thankfully, I'm also really good at, you know, that kind of uh, heaviness and that sadness. Once I finish the story, I'm really able to just kind of put it on the shelf and I move on to the next one, which maybe is a little more fun uh, or maybe dark, but, you know, dark in a different way. You know, there's certain things that we as a culture have become a little desensitized to. Uh, common things, uh, but there are some stories that are really tough to do. And, you know, after I finish, I just listen to some music, uh, watch a YouTube video or, you know, play some video games, whatever it is I want to do to just kind of chill out. I mean, I don't want to sound all pretentious about it and make it about me because it's it's almost an honor to be telling these stories. <laughs> if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit like and subscribe to my channel and stay tuned for more creepy videos and other content. If you visited one of these locations, I'd love to hear your stories in the comments.